there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, Uncensored News, Views and Commentary. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Walls, former True News CFO Chris Steinley. We'll be here later in the program to talk about Bible prophecy and the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's going to be a great interview with Chris Steinley. Doc Burkhardt told me one day that I'm the only minister he's ever worked for that deliberately says things on the radio to chase off listeners and donors. Well, I'm going to do it again today. Our topic today is the secret pre-tribulation rapture doctrine that many American evangelical churches and ministries believe and promote. Well, just because you believe something doesn't make it true. Mr. Chris Steinle is on the telephone from the beautiful desert of Arizona. Chris is a Bible teacher and author. His favorite subject is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Some of his books are Foundations of the Faith, Ancient Words, Greek New Testament, Come Out of Her, My People, The Last Enemy of Christ, The Rise of Western Lawlessness. His newest book is Why Most Christians Believe in a Post-Tribulation Rapture. Chris, glad to have you back on True News. Oh, Rick, it's great to be back. Man, this is such a hot topic, but it's really coming to the forefront right now. Don't don't you have the wrong title? Shouldn't your title be Why Most Christians Believe in a Secret Pre-Tribulation Rapture? You wouldn't believe the hot emails I've been getting. And to be fair, they're trying to speak the truth in love, and they're trying to correct me, and they're saying, well, don't you want to count yourself worthy kind of thing? The Pew Foundation reported in... 2010, there were about 2.2 billion Christians in the world. And now, if you go online and you look at secular sources like Wikipedia, they say there are approximately 2.6 billion Christians. That's not counting the church in China and the growing church in the Middle East. So we don't know what those numbers are, but there could be three or three and a half billion professing Christians in the world. That's a more realistic number. So, you know, this is a a well-kept secret, but as much as half the world's population are professing Christians. And don't they believe in a secret pre-tribulation rapture? Well, okay, here's the other numbers. When you look at the sources, there were roughly 650 million Christians who belong to Christian denominations that teach the rapture will occur before the time of the Great Tribulation. These denominations are, it's kind of interesting, I don't want to say bedfellows, a consortium of cessational Baptists, charismatic assemblies of God, and a number of smaller Jesus movement churches. So if we use the more conservative number of two and a half billion Christians, that means about one-fourth of today's Christians believe in the pre-trib rapture, or about 25%. If you use a more realistic number, it's probably no more than 20%. And the, and the overwhelming majority of those who believe in a secret pre-trib rapture live in the United States. Yes. Well, you know, they're called the modern Protestants. That's the classification that most of these churches are under. And that means they've rejected the end-time views of the Protestant fathers and the reformers. They rejected those, and so they call themselves modern Protestant churches. It's kind of like the American people rejecting what the founding fathers of the United States had to say and deciding they can come up with something better. That's kind of like what's happening, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it is. Well, in the past, when people have read the Bible on their own, they didn't see, and, and I'll talk about that up until the 19th century, they didn't see a pre-tribulation rapture. I was saved in one of these churches that taught pre-trib. But after a few years, I began to run across some problems in the scriptures. For instance, Jesus said 
Jerusalem would be trampled underfoot and God's people would die by the edge of the sword until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. See, but pre-trib teaches that the Jews will suffer these hardships after the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And likewise, the Old and New Testament say that when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, that all Israel will be saved. Well, pre-trib teaches that when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, the church will immediately get saved by the rapture. And the poor Jews will be left behind to suffer the kind of afflictions that are supposed to happen until the time of the Gentiles has been fulfilled. So we got some huge, huge problems with what Jesus and uh, the Old Testament prophets had to say. And then there's the logical issues I begin to run across. And here's one of the main things that I was thinking about. What about the church and God's wrath? If somebody's saved during the tribulation, would they be under God's grace and under God's wrath at the same time? Okay, if there are so-called Jewish elect, would they be under grace and under wrath at the same time? You see, because Paul says in Romans 8 that Christ cannot be for us and against us at the same time, and that the tribulation cannot separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here's the question. Why couldn't the church remain under grace during the time of God's wrath if these other groups can do it? Why doesn't it work for the church? So these are some of the initial things I began to think about. And of course, when I began to teach in the church, then I had to hold myself to a higher standard and I had to really research and see and realizing that I was taking the minority position. The pre-trib is the minority position so you really got to be sure. What, Rick, you know, James... You know, what you just James. said is shocking to some people right now, that the belief in the secret pre-trib rapture doctrine is the minority position in the global well, church of God. Well, that's why I went over those numbers right up front, because, you know, a lot of them just, they can't believe it. It's, it's almost like Luke Skywalker. No, it's not true. You know, it, it, they have this idea that it's just not there. Here's, so, here's why. Uh, let's talk about why it's hard for pre-trib rapture uh, believers to, to comprehend that they're in the minority. It's because they're in the United States. They fellowship in churches and denominations that are radically pro-secret pre-trib. And... They listen to Christian radio where they hear other ministers that are radically secret pro-trib. They watch Christian television where they see ministers that are radically secret pre-trib. And so they surround themselves with people that say the same thing. And they never expose themselves to any other thought. That's why I brought up the fact that when people have read their Bible on their own before the 19th century, they didn't see it. You know, if a person, and I use the stranded on a desert island test, you know, you're stranded on a desert island with the Bible, and you read the Bible, and what do you see there? Well, if you read the Bible, you obviously see that sexual immorality, like homosexuality and adultery and other perversions, are a sin. You have to be taught by a church that those things are okay. Because you just don't get that. Basic Bible interpretation, there's a saying, the obvious meaning is the obvious meaning. And so that's why it wasn't taught. A few people, it crossed their mind. We see that in some of the writings of the church fathers and, and other people over the years. But it was always dropped like a hot rock. It never made it into any serious discussions. It was never part of any of the ecumenical councils. You know, they never brought up and, and discussed the issue because they just didn't see it in the Bible. And so it's one of those things that you have to ask yourself, you know, before I go further, let me go back to James for just a second because I, I don't want to run off people, really, that, that want to seriously consider this. And James said that wisdom that's from above is peaceable and that it's willing to yield. And so there are probably listeners out there who are pre-trib, and, and a lot of them are probably questioning. In the back of their mind, they realize, well, you know, I really don't see that in the Bible on my own either, but 
my church is so adamant about it that I don't know what to do. And, and so they're kind of on the fence. And so I would just say, w- listen to what we have to say and be willing to yield. If, you, if the Holy Spirit of truth speaks to your heart that the things that are being said are the truth of God, then be willing to yield. That's what I would ask on that. Rick, you know, as far as the obvious meaning, the first and second Thessalonian letters are really at the forefront of the tribulation and the rapture discussion. If I could take just a couple minutes to go over first and second Thessalonians, just Paul's end times comments, I can show the obvious meaning of these verses in such a way I believe the spirit of truth will speak to people, and they will not be able to let this go. Would that be okay if I took to do that? All right. Now, first of all, I just want to give a little overview. We can come back to this and discuss it more in detail. But Paul believed very strongly in order and orderliness, you know, and that's what he says in, in Corinthians there, you know, let everything be done decently and in order. Order is a big deal to him. So his end time verses contain a number of conditionals. That is, it's a this can't happen until that kind of statements. So he's putting things in order, and we see those in First and Second Thessalonians. In First Thessalonians 4, Paul says the Lord's coming can't happen until the resurrection of the dead. And in Second Thessalonians 2, the Lord's coming can't happen until the appearing of the man of sin and the apostasy. Anybody that studied end-time prophecy is familiar with these conditional statements, but let's take a look now at another conditional statement, which is really the key to understanding the Thessalonian letters, and that's in 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm not going to read from it right now. We can do that if we want to in a minute. But there, Paul starts out talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And he is saying all the people that saw him, all the people that saw him at the same time, and why Christians must believe in the resurrection of Jesus. They're they're our hope, you know, our our new life in heaven, our, our future, our treasure, everything, our forgiveness of sins. It's all nothing without the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus didn't overcome and he's not seated at the right hand of the Father, then the Christian faith really means nothing. But then he goes on. He transitions into the time of the end. He said, then comes the end. And he begins to discuss the general resurrection of the dead. And this is also that section where he says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And so, you know, the Bible obviously says that there's a rapture. A rapture is going to happen. There's going to be a time when people who are alive are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, just as is said in 1 Thessalonians 4. But in that same section of 1 Corinthians 15, he gives another conditional statement, and he's quoting Psalm 110. And speaking of Jesus, Paul says, He must reign till... He has put all enemies under his feet. And then Paul adds, the last enemy that will be destroyed or overcome is death. Now, Jesus had personally already overcome death. So Paul's associating, he's in the context of these verses, that the last enemy, death, is the general resurrection of the dead. That future time when, as it says in John 5, he'll call and those who are in their graves will come forth. And so... Paul says that that death, that victory over death that's associated with the resurrection of the dead is the last enemy. So Peter also makes a conditional statement similar in Acts 3.21, and he says Jesus must remain in heaven until the time of the restoration of all things. Just in a nutshell, let's go back now quickly to First and Second Thessalonians and watch what happens. In 1 Thessalonians 4, since Jesus must sit at the Father's right hand until his last enemy, death, is subdued, he can't descend from heaven until the dead are raised. Christ's coming or descending cannot precede the resurrection of those who have fallen asleep. You see this, Rick? Does that make sense Mm -hmm. to you? Go ahead. All right. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 
Paul mentions two more enemies, and these are straight out of Daniel chapter 12, because neither one of these are the last enemy. These two problems must be resolved even before the resurrection of the dead. You could say that these are the next to the last enemies. So that day and the gathering cannot happen until the man of sin is revealed and the falling away comes first. So Paul had evidently already explained this order of Christ's enemies to the Thessalonians on a previous visit because he says he's reminding them of what he had talked about to them before. And it's probably the same thing that he talked about that he wrote to the Corinthians. This idea, here's God's enemies, here's the last enemy, and here's the order that things need to happen. Does this make sense? Yes. Is, is this mm-hmm. not the... See, to me, growing up, reading the Bible, I started reading the Bible, King James Version, when I was in grade school. And when I've read First and Second Thessalonians, I've always thought that the day and the gathering from First and Second Thessalonians are talking about the same thing. That's one of the things that really bugged me when people started trying to teach me about the rapture. Right? And they would say, well, no, Second Thessalonians is talking about something different. And I thought, what? What? See, but, but this works. You see, if you understand what Paul was saying, you can't get this wrong. You really can't get anything else out of it because this is the obvious meaning. But Rick, the real death blow to the pre-tribulation rapture theory is right here in First Thessalonians 4. Here's what it is. Jesus is either seated in heaven or he's descending from heaven. First Thessalonians 4 says he's descending from heaven. So Jesus coming and descending from heaven, it's a technical indicator. It's like a trigger event. It signals that all of Jesus' enemies have been made his footstool. This is a one-time event. In Paul's chronology, it's a package deal. Paul would never write about Jesus coming and descending from heaven unless he was referring to the actual second coming of Christ. Because it would be like a spiritual balk on Christ's part. It would be an unrighteousness. Because you you know that the the most rabid, secret, pre-trib rapture teachers teach and believe there is a secret, and this is why I always emphasize, underline, secret. They teach that that the Lord comes back secretly for the church, and then seven years later, He comes back again. Now, it's not in the Bible. They'll swear up and down that it is in the Bible, and that you are too biblically illiterate to see what they can see. But it's not in the Bible. But that's the essence of what they teach. They'll say, you're right, Chris. You know, this is referring to the second coming. But we're not talking about the second coming. The rapture is not the second coming. That's what they teach. What I'm saying is this is a technical issue, that once Christ is no longer seated, he's he's not going to... Oh, boy. Well, look at the way that they teach it. If you're reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and you see what's there, uh, he's writing to comfort the bereaved. He's telling them that they're dead aren't going to miss out on anything. That's the hope. That's the consolation. It's the same as he's telling them, you know, it's Job chapter 19, that, you know, though their flesh will die, somehow with their own eyes they'll see their Redeemer standing on the earth. And, and these people, you know, were hoping Jesus would come back before they died, and they'd see people die, and they would expect Jesus, and they didn't want him to miss out on anything. But look at how the pre-trib teachers and movies and novelists teach this. No voices, no trumpets, no appearing, no descending, no coming, and no resurrection of the dead. Do you think that's a good way to teach First Thessalonians chapter 4? Why is it necessary to leave out all that information? Well, because this same text tells us three times this priority that the resurrection has to happen first. Well, if people think about that, they understand, well, wait a minute, the resurrection of the dead happens near the end of things, 
after the tribulation. So they just can't put that stuff in the books and movies, and they have to just take out this rapture scene and, and plant it by itself. Because if they put it, if they touch the context of the verse they're pulling it out of, it doesn't work, and people will people will say, "Well, wait a minute now, wait a minute, wait a minute. What what about all this fanfare?" What about the dead bursting forth from their graves? Did, did we miss something here? You see, that's, a, that's the dead giveaway right there. Oh, there's a difference between Bible interpretation and indoctrination, folks. That's, I hate to say that. and You know, your pastors love you. A lot of them are parroting what they've been taught in seminary. And they don't understand. You know, James said, let not many of you be teachers. And... And so I would just ask any pastors who are listening to us right now to to search your heart. Pray that the Spirit of Truth would speak to your heart. Can you honestly say that you would go through the Scriptures on your own and present what it's saying this way? You know, another thing, as we go through those, people will say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about the comfort? What, What about the hope? You're, you're taking away the <laughs> the comfort. You're taking away the blessed hope. Yeah, the blessed hope is appearing. Jesus Christ himself. Yeah, heaven opening and him appearing. And it's, so not get, movie, it's not me getting out of here that's the blessed no. hope. It's the Lord coming back. Right. If we go to the Greek in this and, and we look at the words that are being used, apentesin is the word that's being used there for, to meet. And it's the same word that's used in Jesus' parable of the the ten virgins who who go out to meet the bridegroom. And they're going out to meet the bridegroom to lead him back to where they came from. They've trimmed their lamps so that they could have light to lead him back to where they came from. It's the same way in every other instance that this word is used, whether it's in the New Testament or the Old Testament Septuagint. It means it's a greeting party, apentacin, uh, ananti, uh, is, is a Greek word, and it means across from, more or less. It can mean in the presence mm-hmm. of, but across from, opposite. And, and apentacin is they meet from the opposite direction. Every time it's used in the Bible, it's a greeting party, including Jesus' reference to the ten virgins. They didn't go out to meet the bridegroom to go back to the bridegroom's house. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. No, go ahead. Finish. No. There, there's nothing here that says Jesus is bobbing for believers. There's, no, there's nothing here that says he's changing his course of direction. This is a greeting party, so it's not an escape in the first place. See, that's the thing that people have been taught. This is an escape. Jesus is going to get us out of the tribulation. It's just not what the Bible says. It's a greeting party. Even the uh, harpazo that's used here uh, in, the, in the Greek, is where, I mean the Latin where we get uh, rapturos. Um, so the church is being caught up in the air to, to greet the conquering king and escort him back. That's correct. That's correct. And, and even people will, will use Harpazo and, and say, well, it's, this is the catching and the, the snatching or the, the stealing away. But it's a different form of the word that's used there. And, and it more relates to uh, someone who has an endearing desire towards someone or something, an object. And that's the word that's used here. They can look it up in the Greek, and they can look it up in the concordances. It's very similar to harpazo. It's probably based on that same word, but the idea is that endearment, that there be, it's, it's like dad comes home from work, and the kids reach up, and he grabs them, takes them up in his arms. What, what do they do? Do they get back in his car and drive back with him to work? No. No, they go in the house and they have dinner and they have fun and and enjoy. All one right, now, okay, Chris, that, that leads me to this question. So when do we go to heaven? Because I hear preachers say, don't you want to go to heaven when the Lord comes back? When You know, when the rapture takes place, we're all going to go to heaven and live in heaven uh, with the Lord forever and ever. And I can't see any place where we where we live in heaven. I see heaven comes to the new earth. And yeah. God, God moves his mailbox. 
He, <laughs> he comes. He comes to the new earth. We don't go to his place and live. He comes to our place and lives. That's what makes this this gospel so amazing. The Creator of the universe comes and lives with the creation. Well, this is another issue because. What Rick, what's happened is the pre-trib teachers will use Jude because it says he'll be coming with 10,000 of his saints. Hagiais is the, the word there. It means holy ones, but they can mean holy people or it can mean holy angels. And so a lot of people say, well, there has to be this, this pre-trib rapture because we got to get the saints into heaven so that they can come back with Jesus in in the real deal. Well, when you look at other scriptures, Jesus in Matthew 25, all that discourse, he says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory with all his holy angels, hagios angloi, he's clarifying who these holy ones in Jude are. It's the holy angels. And again, we see that. In, actually, this is very interesting because it's right there in First Thessalonians in chapter 3. It says that Jesus is coming with his mighty angels. So the Bible even clarifies who it is that's coming back with Jesus. Now, if we say that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, then those who have died would also be coming back, I guess. I, I don't know. It's, it's a possibility. But, but the thing is, they haven't been reincorporated at that point. That's what the resurrection of the dead is all about. That's the, the catching up in the air and the changing, being changed in the twinkling of an eye. They, we have a, a spiritual change of address when we put our faith in Jesus and, and we're in him and our treasure is in him, our eternity is in him, our new life is in him. But this is a mystery. There's, some, there's a, a reincorporation that takes place and that's what Paul is getting at. But if we think about the people who have died in the last 2,000 years, Rick, if you just figure a 70-year generation, this is the most conservative number. The most conservative number is that at least 97% of all Christians up until this time are already in heaven. We don't have to have a rapture to get more Christians in heaven to come back with Jesus. See, even, even if it were saints that's coming back with Jesus... The rapture isn't necessary to get more people there. Well, it only makes sense, but what does logic have to do with this, Chris? Uh, Well, you know, that leads me to this question. You know, so um, if if the the rapture is at the end of the age, obviously the return of the Lord is at the end of the age, and the pre-trib rapture people teach that there are seven years of tribulation, I personally don't believe that. I just, the Lord said that there's going to be tribulation so great it's never happened before. Yes. He didn't say there's going to be seven years of the great tribulation. But anyhow, they teach the seven years, and it's going to be really bad for seven years, and particularly the last three and a half years, is going to be miserable, all kinds of things happening, and that's when, that's why the church won't be here. But the, if, if this is the end of the age, it means time is running out. We're down to just a few grains of sand in the, in the hourglass. What's the big deal in getting out? I mean, it's over, right? Eternity. We're going into eternity. What does it matter if you physically have to get out of here? What's the big deal about it? You know, a lot of Protestants, interestingly enough, would uh, condemn the Roman Catholic Church because they would say that they were trying to establish God's kingdom on the earth in advance of Christ's second coming. But Jesus said that our kingdom is not of this world. And, you know, if you look at the apostles' lives themselves, Paul wrote about this, and and he said, we're spectacles you know, we're going around, we're mistreated, we're, we're uh, not clothed, we go hungry, we're rejected by everybody. You know, they were living in poverty and, and rejection and abuse. And I, I don't know why it is that uh, Christians today, it's almost like they're teaching the health, wealth, and pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. That because you're under grace, God's not going to let 
you go through anything too terrible. But you see, I think one of the reasons why pre-trib is American. falling a, yeah why that, why pre-trib is falling apart is because people say, well, wait a minute, how come those Christians in the Middle East didn't get raptured? How come all of those Christians in in, well, in the Chris, Sudan? I, I will tell you what I have heard American Christians say in answer to that question, and it's it is a disgusting answer that they give I I have heard ministers say they're not real Christians yeah well somebody who is uh, shedding their blood and confessing Christ unto death um, if if they think that uh, Jesus is going to turn them away because they've got uh, their theologies tweaked a little bit the wrong way um, wow Again, it's 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 the American arrogance. Uh, the American Christians are uh, the ones that you know the, that are at the center of everything, and these other people just you know well they're they're not good Baptists. That's the yeah. problem. They're not they're, they're not they're not assemblies of God. They're not you know they're not uh, they don't have TBN uh, there to watch. Uh, they can't be real Christians. So that's why they're going through this because, uh, we Christians here in America aren't going to be raptured. I mean, well, we're not going to, we're not, uh, we Christians here in America are are not going to be persecuted. Yeah. The, the, the media is definitely swayed. And, and here's why the media and the novelists are definitely swayed because if you look at the, uh, Daniel 70 weeks, the first 69 weeks were what I would call, quote, unquote, normal. They were normal. You had 69 normal weeks, but the 70th week is going to be a sci-fi. And it's been floating out there for a couple thousand years. That's yeah. just floating that week. That week, it just... Uh, you know, a lot of, again, the people that believe in the pre-trib rapture, they don't understand what this doctrine is teaching uh, about Daniel's 70 weeks or the way that the, the pre-trib people teach it, that those 69 weeks took place uh, in successive years, and then it just stopped, and the 70th year hasn't taken place yet. Yeah. Yeah, but the the whole thing I was getting at is, is this: they can make these sci-fi movies, you see, mm-hmm. and they can write these thriller novels uh, because they're turning the seventieth week in, into a sci-fi. And wh- but why do people? Why would people think that? As we've talked about before, you know, the sky's going to turn purple, and and or or everything's going to become uh, uh, like Gotham City, you know. And all of these weird things are going to be happening. No, no, there's and always a normal. There's always a normal, and people adjust and adapt to the new normal. Well, that's true. That's and so, true. And so as, as things worsen on the earth, most people will consider it normal. I agree with you that it would be really hard to fit um, all of Revelation into a seven-week period. In fact, a view of Revelation that's called uh, uh, the preterist view was rejected because they were saying that all of Revelation happened in 70 years, that it all happened before the destruction of the temple. And the church said, well, wait a minute. No, all of the things in Revelation couldn't possibly happen in a 70-year period. And and that's why they have to turn seven years into a sci-fi to get everything done that needs to be done. And this is one of the things that I bring up in the book is pre-trib says they teach an imminent return of Christ. And in the book, I go into the 1800s and I look at what's happening over in the British Isles where the pre-trib rapture doctrine got its roots and I look at um, the Zionist movement and a lot of things. There, let me just divert for for a moment. Back then, I want to touch on this. Yeah, because Chris, I wanted to ask you about okay. this because the 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 second leg of this doctrine is Zionism. Right. Mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. the people who are the most the people who are the most radical about the secret pre-tribulation rapture doctrine are also the most 
rabbit uh, Christian Zionists in, in believing that the political state of Israel is at the front and center of everything God is doing, and the church is just some little side act. Well, let me explain how uh, this happened. From the time of the Protestant reformers, and, and so um, as early as the 1600s, the church looked at Acts 3.21 and, and where Peter says that Jesus must remain in heaven until the time of restoration of all things. And they felt like because of the little ice age and, and all the things that were going on, you know, about a third of the people in the world died through wars and famine and plagues during that time. And, and Jeffrey Parker writes about this in, in his book. And so they felt like they were right at the very end, and they thought that the last thing that needed to happen was the conversion of the Jews. And so by 1809, they had the London Society for Promoting Christianity Among the Jews. And they even had a branch office in Jerusalem, and pretty soon the Scottish got involved, and they sent an expedition over there. This was uh, Robert McChaney and Andrew Bonner and... Uh, Black and some other ministers, and they came back and they wrote a book called The Narrative of a Visit to the Holy Land and Mission of Inquiry to the Jews. They wanted to find out what the condition of the Jews' hearts were to receive the gospel over there. Here's what they thought. They thought that when the Jews believed that the Lord would return, that that would be the restoration. That what The original restoration movement wasn't restoration back to the early church it was it was a restoration of the jews and they thought if they could it began to occur to them if we can just get the jews to move back to the holy land because there were only at, at most 10,000 over there in the early 1800s they thought if they get, if we can just get them back into their own land the spirit of god will fall upon them they'll they'll look upon him whom they pierced and they'll they'll believe and then the lord will return they thought they were going to usher in the return of the lord by converting the jews and so i've got an article and i had to transcribe this myself this is from the the london times and um i i have in the book uh, the people that were promoting this but they got a front page full length article and here's here's the article to the protestant powers of north of Europe and America, Victoria, by the grace of God, and it goes over um, Frederick, uh, William of Prussia, King of Netherlands, Charles, Sweden, uh, Hanover, Württemberg, um, everybody. It says, high and mighty ones, the most high God who reigns in the kingdom of men. And, and, but it goes on and on, and it's an appeal to get, it's an appeal to get the Jews back to their land. But the purpose of it, Chris, was this belief that if the Jews went to, back to the Holy Land, they would get saved. It wasn't, yes. it, the motivation wasn't they have to reconstitute the political state of Israel. Well, here's the deal. There, there began to be this kind of chicken and the egg thing. And, and this is what uh, John Darby uh, realized. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. If... All Israel is saved. Um, will will the restoration of all things happen when all the Jews are converted, or will all the Jews be converted at the restoration of all things? You know, which which is it that comes first? And I I think that was really the basis for for uh, him putting together. Uh, starting to put together this theology. Obviously, I have the history of this, and and clear back to the 1500s, Rabira, who's called the father of futurism, and his contribution, and uh, that's in this book as well. But um, what in the end, in the end, though, you see, an imminent return wasn't even possible according to pre-trib zone assumptions until Israel got back to the land. And here's what the assumptions are. The assumptions are end times events contained in Revelation occur after the rapture. That's the first assumption in their doctrine. Okay. The end times events described in Revelation occur within a seven-year time span. Okay. 
Antichrist will enter the temple three and a half years after the rapture. Well, what that means is the Jews must have either taken control of the Temple Mount or be so close to gaining control of Jerusalem that the end times might commence at any moment. This is another... See, well, because it's not true, folks, it just doesn't work. And I go through, in the book, I go through all of the things. Well, that doesn't have anything Re- to do with Revelation it. 3. Yes, they're going to teach it anyhow. All of the things about the Philadelphian church and what the Greek says and, and what's actually being said there. But, but you see, the, an imminent return doesn't even work within pre-trib. And, and if you think about it, they haven't even broken ground on the Temple Mount construction. They haven't even gotten the property yet. And so, until they get that thing under construction, and it's so that three and a half years later it has to be built and they have to be doing sacrifices the the imminent return doesn't work for pre-trib any more than it works for for a second coming rapture in fact the early church always looked at the imminence of the tribulation as part of christ's return chris this, the doctrine that is taught today in the um evangelical Christian churches in America, the the pre-trib rapture doctrine, what exists today is not what was being taught by the proponents of the secret pre-trib rapture a hundred years ago. No. A hundred or fifty years ago. This thing, they've added to this thing. They, and and when I get, you know, I I envision, um, it's like, you know, they're they're stretching they're they're stretching this scripture, and they've got uh, tie downs, and they're holding they're holding this scripture together with with tie downs, and they got masking tape wrapped around things, and yeah, wall charts. They they got everything to hold this thing together, um, and they've been building, building, and building, and building this doctrine over 150 some years, but it's nothing. Today, it is, this, this monstrosity that they're teaching today isn't even close to what Darby was teaching. No, and, and what most people don't realize is that Charles Spurgeon was adamantly opposed to, to Darby. because and, and I have this in my book, uh, an article that uh, Tommy Spurgeon uh, wrote, and he still has up on a website. People can read about it. And uh, Spurgeon's fear, you see, that the conversion of the Jews would be neglected and that these efforts to restore the Jews to usher in the time of the Lord's return would all be put off. And people would just say, oh, well, they'll all get saved anyway. And that's precisely you know? what's happening today. The, yeah. the, the Christian Zionists make no effort to to preach the gospel to Jews all of their energy is in the defense of the political state of Israel. Yeah, I've got chapters in my book on the Israel question and exactly who is Israel, because Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2, says the believing Jews and the believing Gentiles have been made one new man, and there are no longer two. And who is Israel? And as you've brought up before, you know, what is non-replacement theology is not trying to replace the one new man with either the unbelieving Jews or, or the believing Gentiles. Yeah, for, the but, record, know, for the record, I want everybody to know that I adamantly oppose replacement theology. I oppose any doctrine that replaces the cross of Calvary with the Star of David. Yeah, and, and that's the, dual the replacement. Covenant. That is the replacement theology that's being taught in America. They have the the Zionists have replaced the cross with the Star of David, and the Star of David originated as an occult symbol. Well, you look at who I ask the question: Who are the Jews? Who is Israel today? And and so if a person is half Jewish, are they Jewish? Or if a person is a quarter Jewish, are they Jewish? And and what about all the intermarriage? And, and might we not all have some Jewish blood in us after 2,000 years? Or is it all the people who are living in the new state of Israel? And what about 
all the Jews who have died before the end comes? Have they all perished like in a game of musical chairs because they lived during the, the wrong time? Who is all Israel that will be saved? And the answer is it just doesn't make sense. And, and I go in quite a bit of detail in my book uh, more into this. Well, the Jews, and, the Jews are only one tribe of, of Israel. Where are the rest of the tribes? And perhaps, Chris, uh, the, the missing tribes of Israel, maybe, maybe we are the descendants. I say we, the, the Christians. Maybe, maybe we have enough Israelite DNA in us to qualify okay. as an yeah. Israelite. Well, that's what I'm getting. And, and see, the, the New Covenant, what Paul said that the mystery that had been revealed is the inclusion of the Gentiles, in the, and the way of salvation isn't genetic anymore. It's by faith. And the believing Gentiles have been grafted in with the believing Jews. You see, it, mm -hmm. even Paul addresses this in Romans uh, 9 through 11. And he goes into great detail and he says that true Israel are the ones under grace. Chris, I, here's another thing that I've got a big beef about with the, with the Christian Zionists. And that is this division between Gentile churches and Messianic churches. Uh -huh. That really... That really ticks me off, because <laughs> how can we be separated between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians? In fact, Jewish believers won't even call themselves Christians. They'll say they're a Messianic Jew. Yeah, and, I'm laughing. And that I'm makes laughing, me Rick. so upset. I'm laughing because the fact is that the issue was never settled during the writing of the New Testament. And that's why when Paul went back to Jerusalem, they said to him, Hey, Paul... We got a lot of Jews here who believe too, and we stay by the traditions, and this is something that's never been solved. And so I, I believe that the, the messianic worship, the, the Judaic worship of Christ, Messiah, is just as valid. You see, because you have to go extra biblical with any kind of argument to say that one is right and the other is wrong, because the issue was never settled even during the the no, the, the, life the, the ideal apostles. the ideal church should be a blend between the Hebraic <laughs> Christians and the the Greek Christians, if you want to call them the Westerners, the Greek. It ought to be a blend. It ought to be, you know. And I, I think we're going to have to wait for heaven for that, because, like I said, if you if you're a Bible believing Christian, you don't go beyond what's written, and that's what Paul said. Don't go beyond what's written if you. If you just use the Bible, we can't sort that out. We just have to wait for heaven, and, and let's just love each other. That's what it boils down to, because the Bible allows for both type of worship. It accommodates both groups. And yeah, but when you, when you start getting over to the um, Hebrew roots folks, they are so far out that you can't even say the name of Jesus. Well, look at the Gentile church. What's their attitude towards the Jews been? Good grief. Are you I mean, right? This is what I'm saying. There needs to be a blending. Well, the Lord's not pleased with this division. It's, it's not going to happen. It didn't happen during the lives of the apostles. It, it's going to be part of the millennial time. That's what we've got going on here. And, you know, that, hey, speaking, you know. speaking, now that you brought that up. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> the, the thousand year millennial reign. All right. Oh, uh, no. All right. And Chris and I have differences of of opinion on this. So this is this is fine, but let's go let's go to uh Second Peter, all right? And Peter said, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now, that's the scripture, the pre-trib rapture uh, proponents quote. When you ask them, show me a scripture that says the Lord is coming secretly, and they'll say, well, uh, he'll, he'll come as a thief in the night. Well, the, the, let's finish the sentence. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. To me, Chris, that's all she wrote. Yeah, you know, what Jesus said, this time that's coming, 
is worse than anything that's happened since the beginning of creation. Where's the thousand years? Well, let me let me touch on that that uh, coming as a thief verse. There's a couple other verses. You know, one of the Revelation churches that was their punishment that if they didn't wake up, the Lord would come like a thief. So that's not a good thing. If the Lord's coming like a thief, that's not a good thing. Paul uh, writes about that too in Thessalonians, and, and he says, "But you are not." in darkness so that that day should come upon you like a thief you see so your scripture reference and and the two that i just quoted really um you just can't pull one verse out of the bible and and said but that's what the pre-tribbers have to do because the obvious meaning is the obvious meaning if you just read through the bible on your own it not only doesn't support the pre-trib rapture but it actually shuts it down just over and over again rick to go back to your question i go back to um, isaiah 24 and you're familiar with this section of scripture and it's isaiah's prophecy about these things that are going to come on the earth Mm -hmm. and that's the scripture the lord gave me that day in april 1998 in the tbn chapel when he gave me the vision of the cities on fire and I asked the Lord for a scripture to verify that the vision was from him. And I, I opened up my Bible and I was looking at Isaiah 24. Yeah. what well, it says, you know, it talks about the earth being empty and there being few men left. It talks about everything being shaken. Um, no food in the city, no wine. There's joy is turned to mourning. As it is then, with the lender, so it is with the borrower. But then in, in verse... 21 it says it shall come to pass in that day that the lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones and on the earth the kings of the earth and so i believe right here in this one verse we see michael casting satan out and we also see this punishing of the sinister kings of the earth these ones that we see in revelation and they're going to be put aside And we see that because the next verse, it says, They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in prison. After many days, they will be punished. Well, here's this time that Isaiah alludes to. There's this waiting period. And you see it in Daniel, too, where the nations... Uh, and the and the kings and the horns and and uh, these powers. It says that some are punished, but some are left a while on the earth until a later time. There's this pause period. It, it's kind of a mysterious thing, and I believe it's a Jewish tradition, but I believe it's correct. Uh, Arrhenius uh, taught it, the seven thousand year theory, that the the last year, the millennial reign, uh, that last thousand year period would be the millennial reign when Christ would would come to the earth and reign in righteousness. I would say to pre-trib people, why can't that be God's big blessing to the Jews? Because being left behind to go through the tribulation uh, isn't my idea of God's big blessing that he's been waiting to give the Jews all this time. What if the time of the Gentiles is everything up until Christ returns and sets everything straight and the, um, that works out a whole lot better yeah but you know the, what really is being taught is that the blessing of God to the Jews is they get the land and the Gentiles get Jesus that's all we get we just get Jesus but the Jews get the land and that's supposed to be a better deal well wait a minute wait a minute then uh, according to the pre-trib rapture theory if the saints come back with Jesus, where are they going to be? Well, I don't know. Well, wait a minute. Where's Jesus going to reign from? Well, according to the uh, the doctor, and he's reigning from uh, Jerusalem. Yeah. So the Christians get to miss out on the tribulation that they no, will have to be. Con- no, we'll have to all. be converted to Judaism. Because that's really. I'm telling you, Chris, what they really teach. Whoa. I'm telling you what the what the Zionists are really teaching is. The Jewish takeover of the world. That's what they're teaching. Well, humanly, that wouldn't be much different than what the Roman Catholic Church tried to do from the Gentile standpoint. But in fact, the only one fit to rule over the world is Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Yes, but if you you really dig deeply into the Zionist teaching in the church, it is 
that the world is run from Israel, and it is it is a very racist doctrine. Well, the, the thing is, they're separating the one new man that God yes. is joining together. If That's we right. think about the fact that, realistically, uh, up to half the world are believers right now. If the Lord came back right now, uh, his, his army would far uh, outnumber any other, especially with the mighty angels. It just takes one of them to, to wipe out uh, 100,000 people or so. But, but it's when they go to separate it. See... Jesus quoted the Old Testament, and in the beginning where God joined man and woman together, he said, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And that's the problem, is people, when they go to meddling, when they, when they go to separate the one new man into Jew and Gentile, you just get a big mess. That's it right. doesn't. It doesn't work. There's no way to make it work because you're separating what God has joined together, and you're not. It's not going to go well for you. God's not going to make that easy. Absolutely. Uh, I, you know, just to try to make it easy for people who who are totally misinterpreting everything I'm saying. All right. I don't believe that the church replaced Israel. I believe Israel and the church are one. We were grafted into Israel. Yes. We, but the, the non-believing Jews are not Israel. The believing Jews are Israel. Correct. And we Gentiles who believed on Jesus were grafted in to Israel. Yeah. That's what is exactly so hard right. about this? This is so basic. <laughs> well, it's a spiritual thing. It takes spiritual, it takes faith and it takes spiritual discernment and obviously the unbelieving jews are tweaked they've been treated very badly by the church and you know it goes back to the early church and the latin church especially especially the roman catholic church and the latin church you know they were excommunicating the eastern churches who were siding with the jewish believers and they had what they called corto decimatarians the people who celebrated Passover on the Jewish Passover. I was going to bring that up, but you I can't say do, that word. You wouldn't want to do that. That uh, you know, they didn't want to have anything to do with Jewish traditions. That's right, and, and this was the, the famous, the famous uh, uh, debate uh, with Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John, and Polycarp uh, told the Bishop of Rome, uh, "And all due respect, sir, John told us to keep Passover." And, and and so the early church clearly um, held on to to the Jewish flavor that was part of their worship. Uh, it was it was yeah, the, it, the, the Roman church, church that began Eastern to change. Churches. Yeah, and this was the Eastern Empire. This, this was this was Constantinople or Byzantium. Mm -hmm. You know, the Byzantine Empire. Um, so this was the the main part of Christianity. You know, in, in my book, um, The Rise of Western Lawlessness, I've got some charts in there of the development of the early church, and, and it makes it very clear that the church was mainly in the East, that the Latin church was an outlier, and that's why it got away with its shenanigans. Yeah. They, hey, they hey, had Rick, their own little councils and stuff. You know, uh, I have just recently, because uh, you know, you, you and I always, we, we love to have conversations. When you were working here, we always love to have conversations about church history. And I just, I just recently came upon um, the, the Assyrian Church of the East. I, I was researching because I want to help our brethren in the Middle East. And... And so I, I came up upon the Assyrian Church of the East, and this this is a whole um, segment of the of the global body of Christ that the West knows nothing about. And and one of the things that when I when I'm reading their books and reading uh, websites uh, that the Assyrian Church of the East uh, control, they they point out that they held on to their to their Jewish traditions. It flavored the the Christian Church of the East, mm -hmm. and 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 to this day they cling to those traditions. I'll, yeah. have, I'll share some of the stuff with you privately. I'll send you what what I'm right. what I've been reading. Yeah. You're going to find it fascinating. Hey, Chris, uh, thank you. I um, we could go on and on and on for a couple more hours talking about Chris's new book. Uh, the book is titled "Why Most Christians Believe in a Post 
tribulation rapture. Uh, Chris, is is this book available now? Yes, it's available at Amazon and Kindle. Um, it's at Smashwords, so people can get the ebook. The paperback will be at Amazon in three to four weeks. But I have these ebooks on sale. They can pick up this book for ninety nine cents at Amazon until the paperback comes out. So a couple weeks, it's going to be on sale. So also, I have set it up on Smashwords for set your own price. So people can actually get it there for free if they want to, to go through Smashwords. It's a little more complicated. Most people have Amazon, but because I really want to get this out there, I'm even offering the PDF of the book free, and I have places where people can download that. How, how do they get the PDF? Well, if they go to comeoutofmypeople.com, I have on the front page a link. Uh, on my contact page, there's a list of my books. I have uh, most of my books are free in PDF. I really am trying to minister to the body of Christ, and I want the information to be out there. I really hope people will share this interview. It's more important to me. I would much rather have this interview go viral uh, than my book go viral. It doesn't matter how it happens, but you know, people need to hear what First and Second Thessalonians are really saying and just how obvious it is. And once you uh, clean off the cobwebs and see what's being said, in my book I've got a few charts. It's not as complex as pre-trib, but just Paul's chronology, his timeline of how he puts things in that order. So um, you can go to Amazon, go to comeoutofmypeople.com. I have a Facebook page. It's all out there. People can get to me that way. But okay. and then, the and interview, the the interview is more important. Share the interview, share this this interview, so that people can hear what I've gone through here. Because I mean, if you're trying to minister to somebody that believes in pre trib, and you go over these things that I went over in First and Second Thessalonians, and how Jesus departing from the right hand of the Father is a one time event. It's a technical indicator in Paul. Could I say just one more thing here? Sure, go ahead. I have followed Paul's journeys. I've been on three Footsteps of Paul tours. I've taught my own tours. I've rented a van and I've driven all over Macedonia and and Achaia and and the Peloponnese. And I've traveled by ship from uh, western Turkey to Neapolis and Philippi and and Thessaloniki and down. I've traveled the interior roads up and down, the Roman highways. I've sailed along Paul's shipwreck course to Italy there. And most of this I did on my own dime. The church wasn't footing the bill for most of this either. I, I've taught all over Israel. I've taught um, in Philippi. I've taught in, at Mars Hill. You know, I've been there. I have studied. I have read Risto Santala's work on Paul from the rabbinical standpoint, and so I have a fairly good understanding of the mind of Paul and how he treats things, and I just implore you, I guarantee you, that Paul would not have Jesus doing some kind of a yo-yo thing, and a bobbing for believers. It just doesn't work with Paul's theology. He would, he would roll over in his grave. Uh, you got to write a book called Bobbing for Believers. It's atrocious, and it's messing up. At the last chapter in my book, I go over, uh, I refer to Pascal's wager and the pre-tribulation wager and what's wrong with believing in, in the pre-trib rapture. A lot of people says, why can't you just leave us alone and, and let us have our happy, uh, our happy thoughts? And, well, there's some problems. Besides it going against most of Scripture, and I have references to so many things in the book. Okay. Um, Chris, you know, we both agree that, you know, what a person believes about the timing of the second coming has nothing to do with their salvation. If no. your faith is in Jesus Christ, what he did for us at Calvary, and you are confessing, uh, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, then you're saved. It has nothing to do with your salvation. It, it is, if you are going to be alive at the time of the end, it's going to have a lot to do with how you get through that time. It, it, you know, you could yes. you, you could believe the, the secret preacher rapture 
uh, decades ago, and it, it wasn't going to affect you because uh, things really weren't uh, ramping up like they are now. But as as we get closer to the day of the Lord, you better make sure your 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 doctrine is right. You better make sure you have a a, a biblically sound understanding of prophecy, or you're going to be totally lost in in a in a sea of swirling. Uh, turbulent water. You're not going to know what to do. It's going to overtake you. And it's not going to keep you from from spending eternity with the Lord, but you, you may enter into that eternity a lot faster because you get yourself killed. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. that's my concern. And the other concern is that, is that we're not we're not evangelizing the lost Jews. That that grieves me. I don't know how people can say they love the Jews and then not tell mm. them about Jesus. Exactly. And you've got churches agreeing that they are not going to evangelize the Jews. That's that that is horrible. Oh, yeah, they're lining up right now to take that uh that stance. And they're and all in the name of, of peace and inclusion. And I have that in my book too about the the Pope and some of the Protestant leaders, what they're doing as far as uh, endorsing dual covenant and even endorsing uh, universalism. That's right. Well, Chris, uh, good talking to you again. And uh, the book is Why Most Christians Believe in a Post-Tribulation Rapture. You can get it for free right now if you want the PDF. It's at uh, comeoutofhermypeople.com. And uh, you can download the uh, Kindle version at Amazon for 99 cents. And in about three weeks or so, the the paperback will be available. So uh, just keep an eye out for that one on Amazon. Good talking to you, Chris. God bless. Yeah, great to talk to you too, Rick. Well, listen, that's it for today's edition of True News. I want to tell you uh, good news. My wife Susan was released from the hospital uh, late yesterday afternoon. And so she's back home. Thank you for praying for her. Uh, she still has an infection in her blood, uh, but she's being treated for that. And my dog Gator, uh, he's still hobbling around on three legs, but a lot of that uh, swelling and pain is gone. I, I'm still concerned that he's not walking on that leg, and uh, well, he's getting he's getting treatment also. A lot has been happening here, more than I, I've told you about uh, this past week. It has been a bizarre, crazy week here at True News in my life. And uh, I just appreciate everybody who remembers to pray for us. Uh, We just keep going regardless of what's happening around us. We're praying for you too. Stand and don't give up any ground to the devil. Just stand. Uh, The battle is the Lord's. He'll fight for you. I'm Rick Wells on behalf of Doc Burkhardt and Edward Zoll. You've been listening to True News. God bless you. We'll see you on Monday.